Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to take a look at a couple different varieties of the RP-46 light machine gun. Now, this was uh, the final iteration of the Degturev light machine gun, which was originally developed after World War II. It was adopted by the uh, Soviet military as the DP-27 or DP-28. You see them referenced different places with different dates, but it's the same gun. Um, and in, in that guise, this was a standard stocked, it didn't have the pistol grip, uh, light machine gun, fi uh, full auto only, had no semi-auto setting, it fired from an open bolt, it actually had a grip safety on the wrist of the stock, um, and that was pretty much it. Fed from a 28 round pan magazine that mounted right up here on top of the action, so a fairly distinctive gun. Uh, this was the standard Soviet machine gun going into World War II and through World War II. Uh, or almost to the end of it. Due to their experience with the gun during World War II, they made a number of changes to it, and they reintroduced a new version of uh, the DPM, modernized, and that's what I have here, well, except for this bit. Uh, the DPM added a pistol grip, and it moved the recoil spring. In the original guns, the recoil spring had actually been located here, wrapped around the gas piston, and they found that uh, under heavy sustained fire, uh, the gas piston would actually get hot enough that the get the recoil spring would lose its temper, temper, lose its heat treat, and stop working. So with the DPM, they relocated the recoil spring to the back of the gun. Well, the receiver hadn't been designed to accommodate a big spring back there, so in order to make this work, they added this extension tube to the back of the receiver. So uh, this and the pistol grip are the two main changes of the DPM. They also changed the bipod. On the DPM, the bipod is bolted directly to the barrel shroud. On the original DP-28s, uh, it was actually a collar clamped around this whole assembly. So this is sturdier. The DPM is really a quite fantastic uh, light machine gun. I've had the chance to do some shooting, actually with a 27, uh, in full auto. They're awesome. They're really great. However, by the end of World War II, they, you know, they introduced the DPM, it was definitely an improvement over the original 27, but what the, the Soviets had found is the universal machine gun concept. So in fighting the Germans in World War II, they came up against the MG-34 and the MG-42, uh, both of which were designed to be, well, the concept was the universal machine gun. It was a gun that could be fired from a bipod, like this, in a light machine gun roll. It could be mounted to a sophisticated, adjustable, heavy tripod, and used as a heavy machine gun for uh, defensive positions, long-range fire, sustained fire, it had a very good quick-change barrel system, both the 34 and the 42. And then it could also be used as a vehicular machine gun, it could be used as an anti-aircraft machine gun. That was the concept. Um, but primarily the issue was, well for the Soviets primarily, the issue was they were, they were fighting Germans with belt-fed machine guns, and they really liked that belt-fed concept, and they didn't have a belt-fed machine gun that could actually be moved around and, and fired from a bipod. They had the uh, the SG-43, which was mechanically different, but I would say conceptually uh, equivalent to the, the US-1919. It was a heavy boxy machine gun that required a mount, wheeled mount or a tripod mount, uh, but then allow, had a heavy barrel and allowed sustained fire being belt-fed. What the Soviets wanted to do was come up with some sort of interim gun that could basically do the same as the MG-34 and the MG-42 had done for the Germans, and that was the RP-46, and that's specifically what we're looking at today. What they did was a really clever conversion. They basically developed a belt feed mechanism that sits right in place of one of the pan magazines. and. While that is, a lot of people think that that's all it is, you just bolt this thing on and presto, your gun has turned into a belt fed. That's not quite actually it. There are actually a, several other modifications that were made at the same time uh, to, to improve other elements of the gun and to make it better at this universal machine gun role. So what we're going to take a specific look at today is, first off, uh, SMG guns semi-automatic not a gun at all, the, the belt feed adapter is just an adapter box. However, SMG has made a reproduction RP-46 belt feed adapter that actually doesn't really require any other parts. It can bolt directly onto a standard DPM or DP-27, including the semi-automatic ones that are on the market. So that's, that's a really cool item to take a look at because it's by far the most easily accessible of the various RP-46 types. 
there, there were three other, well, there were three countries that manufactured RP-46s, those being the Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. And we have a set of parts from a Russian one, a Soviet one, and a set of parts from a North Korean one here today that we're going to take a look at because they're actually a bit different from each other. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is that you can't take an original RP-46 belt feed adapter like this, you can't take that and just bolt it on to a standard gun because, well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, it won't actually fit. So why don't we go ahead and bring the camera back over here and let me show you why this won't fit on a standard gun, what they did to change it, and the other modifications that they made to the guns. All right, we should probably do a brief section here on how this thing actually works as a belt feed adapter, and because it's really quite clever. So first off, you have this reciprocating slide, and this section right in here actually holds the charging handle of the uh, Degtrev gun that this is mounted on. So when the bolt handle goes forward, it pulls it forward like this. When the bolt handle goes back, it slams into it here and runs it back. So this whole thing is mounted to the Degtarev's reciprocating charging handle. Now, once we look inside, what you can see is there's, it's actually a pretty simple system. You've got a, a cam track right here, and that's going to pull this feed pawl side to side. So uh, when the thing goes forward, the pawl comes out to the right, and this feeds from the right. And then when the, the bolt handle is going backwards, it's pulling this in to the left. So we also, I should say, we also have a feed stop on the top right there, spring loaded, and we have a feed arm right there. The purpose, so in short, the purpose of this is to pull the belt in. The purpose of this is to prevent the belt from falling back out. And the purpose of this is to push each cartridge down uh, into the DP feed system. So cartridges are going to get pushed down right here. This duplicates the feed lips on a standard pan magazine. In fact, we'll pull that out. You can see the similarity between that and that. So when this is working, a belt is going to come in here. It's going to snap over this feed pawl, which is going to sit in between two cartridges. So it sits there, and then when the feed pawl, when the, the bolt handle is moving backwards, so when you fire, that is going to pull the belt in one position. When this goes forward, then this stop right there is going to be holding like this on this cartridge, so it prevents the belt from moving backwards. However, this stop right here is going to go back when the bolt goes forward, so it is going to snap past to the next round, like that. To me, one of the coolest parts of this whole operation is how this thing actually grabs a round out of the belt, because it looks really simple. Well, the answer is these are actually slightly spring-loaded, and when this goes all the way forward, it's just going to snap around. Let's see if I can get it to do this without the top cover actually being down. So that is actually going to pop around the rim of the cartridge when the bolt goes all the way forward. Yep, ha ha, just like that. Now you can see these two squared off hooks are in front of the rim. So on the next cycling of the action, when the bolt starts to go backwards, is going to tear that round backwards out of the belt all the way to here. It's then going to drop down into this position right there, and it's pushed down into there by this spring, and it gets pushed into this position where it's then fed into the action, just like it was coming out of a magazine. All right, so with the original magazine in place, the gun looks like this. And to remove the magazine, you pull back here, and the magazine just lifts up out of its locking catches. Those locking catches specifically are a pair of tabs right here, and a shelf right here. The tabs go into this riveted on bracket on the front of the gun, like that. And then the shelf drops in behind this little angled 
release catch. So the RP46 duplicated that. It's got a pair of milled spaces right here that fit under that front tab, and then when we close it, there we go, we have a shelf right back here that fits under the magazine catch. Now the reason that this can't simply bolt directly onto a standard uh, DP27 or 28 or DPM is this bit at the front. So there is a carry handle on these, which you can obviously see. When the gun is being fired, the carry handle is bent, is folded down out of the way like this so that it doesn't interfere with your sight picture. However, when you're carrying the gun, obviously you lift that up to carry the gun by. When you do that, it has a little locking bracket that rotates into position here and engages into a cutout in the barrel shroud. That cutout does not exist on the standard DP machine guns. And without that, it's really pretty awkward to move this thing around, or even to get it to fit quite all the way down. On a proper RP46 barrel shroud, there will be a T-slot cut in the back of the shroud to accommodate that carry handle lug. That way, what that's doing is it means that when you're carrying the gun, you're actually carrying it by the strength of the barrel shroud here, not by this riveted on section and the spring-loaded magazine catch. Another element of the gun that was changed substantially uh, to accommodate, well, for the RP46 was the gas block. So the gas block is integral onto the barrel. It's pinned onto the barrel on the DP uh, series of guns, all of them. Uh, it is adjustable here, although it's kind of annoying and a pain in the butt to adjust it. And the way it actually works is there is a little uh, a tube here. Gas is pushed out the center of this tube, and the operating rod, uh, well, the, the bolt carrier is directly connected to the gas piston of the gun, and that gas piston nests over the outside of the gas block there. So the total engagement is about an inch long, just like that. Once uh, the gas piston starts moving, as soon as it gets to about here, it unlocks the action, and now any excess gas is vented out of the system, because the gas block and the piston are, are completely separated at this point. Now the, that worked fine for the standard DPM and DP28, the guns where the magazine spring provides all of the feed pressure that you need. Well the problem comes when you have a belt-fed adapter, now uh, you've got to somehow there is no spring in the belt feed adapter So something has to provide the energy to pull the belt up into the gun to pull around out of the link um, This used standard PKM PK links of course the PK didn't exist at that time uh, But that's the same belt that was used by the SG 43 and by the the Russian Maxim guns So it's a very standard belt It's the belt that they had around and it's a fairly tight belt and it's a you because of the the rimmed 762 by 54 bottleneck case, uh, you have to pull the cartridge backwards out of the belt in order to feed it. So that's going to take a lot more energy than just pushing around out of a spring-loaded magazine. And they had to do something to, 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 to accommodate that. What they did was completely redesign the gas block. So this is a Soviet RP-46 gas block. First off, you'll notice that the barrel section here is a lot thicker than the standard DP barrel. Um, and that was done because as a belt-fed gun, the RP-46 was expected to have a much higher sustained uh, fire capacity, so it needed a heavier barrel to absorb more heat. Uh, at the same time, they designed a much heavier gas block to go on it, and the adjustment system here is really quite simple. Uh, you have this plug with a couple of holes in it, and you just use a hammer, basically, and smack it through to whichever notch right there uh, you want it to be on. These are conveniently numbered, uh, one in the center, two and three. Presumably one is the smallest, and three is the biggest. Now, at the same time that they replaced the gas block, they also replaced the gas uh, piston. This all has to work a bit differently, because it has to give a lot more energy to the operating system of the gun. So where the original DP had about a one inch overlap on the gas piston, the RP-46 actually has the gas piston go inside the gas block, and it's an engagement surface that's about twice as long. So this is sitting that far inside the gas block. So you have a much longer period of time where the gas is, is directly acting on the gas piston 
to put energy into the system. And that allows, uh, allows this gun to actually pull a loaded belt up, strip a cartridge out of it, and function reliably. One last cool change to the RP-46 was the bipod. They decided, apparently, that uh, they wanted to have a cleaning rod on the RP-46. There had not been any cleaning rod uh, attached into or associated with the uh, DP and DPM, but they wanted one on the new gun. So where does one put a cleaning rod on this gun? And the answer they came up with was, put it on the bipod. So the RP-46 bipod actually has has had its design changed a bit. It's got two little locking collars here, which allow us to mount four cleaning rod sections onto the bipod. Pull those off. So this little catch is spring-loaded, you push it in, and then the collar slides up, and then you can pull off your two cleaning rod sections. Three of them are just plain sec pieces of threaded rod, and the last one has a couple slots for cleaning patches on it. So you can see the difference in the, uh, the bipod legs there. The original ones are just solid round bar stock, or stamped, I think they're hollow inside to reduce weight, where the RP-46 have been uh, crimped in so that you have two little uh, channels for the cleaning rod sections, and then they've had these collars added top and bottom to retain them. So that's a really cool element that I think a lot of people don't know about. Um, it is possible to mill the, uh, the, the notch in a DP barrel shroud and put on the adapter and have a gun that looks like it's proper, even though it probably won't work reliably. A lot of people, I think, have not actually seen the original complete uh, purpose-built RP-46. All right, now I'd like to take a minute to compare the Russian and the North Korean examples. Uh, some of the old books, uh, the older reference books, say that the North Korean is an exact copy of the Russian RP-46, but it's actually not. There are a number of distinct differences. So we can just start off with some markings. This is the Russian top cover, uh, marked 1946. And then this is the North Korean top cover. It's the, uh, the finish is pretty much all gone, but uh, you can clearly see the North Korean uh, star logo. And we have a serial number here, and then this is marked Type 64, and uh, that was the North Korean designation for the RP-46. Um, I believe they actually adopted it in 1964, and I believe they're still using them today. So aside from these markings, the Russian and North Korean top cover assemblies appear to be exactly the same. Well, almost exactly the same. The one difference that I have found is on the Russian one, uh, there is a little bit more of a cutout right here than there is on the North Korean one right there. That seems trivial. Uh, the one impact it has is that it means the Russian one will open 90, or the, the North Korean one will open about 90 degrees and then stop. The Russian one will open a bit farther out like that before it stops. So these are both sample sizes of one, and I can't tell you if this is unique to these particular examples or if it's generalized, but there is that difference. The more significant difference, however, is in the gas blocks and barrel shrouds. So on the North Korean one here, we actually have the front sight located on the gas block itself, which is located on the barrel. So the idea here, in theory at least, is each barrel could be individually zeroed to the gun, assuming that the lockup is uh, returns to zero well enough that you can do that in advance. That is sort of an advantage. Uh, with the Russian one, here, you can see that the front sight is located on the barrel shroud, and the barrel itself, this gas block, has nothing on it. So the advantage here is you've got a little bit less awkward protrusion on all of your spare barrels. However, you're going to zero the gun, and hopefully each of the barrels will be close enough to the same zero to be fully functional. Now. With a belt-fed gun, where you're often going to be firing or aiming based on uh, where bullets are impacting, that's probably not that big a deal. Um, but it is a notable and distinctive difference between the Russian and the North Korean production. In addition, we also have totally different styles of gas block on the two guns. So you already saw the Russian one here, uh, where this plug gets pushed uh, forward or back to line up whichever gas hole you want to use. 
The North Korean one has a system where you have this locking bolt, and what you do is loosen this out, and then you can push the, the whole assembly, this and the plug on this side, out, and you have a little locking pin there. The thing's full of cosmoline and rust, and it's too tight for me to move right now, but uh, you can rotate this pin to either of these other two positions, and they are marked one, two, and three, uh, and that allows you to change which uh, which setting you're using. You can see a slot right there on the plug that's going to limit the amount of gas transfer. So, uh, totally different gas block designs as well as uh, front sight locations. One last difference here, and I'm a little hazy on this one. Um, what I have here is actually a Polish DPM lower, well, trigger frame assembly. Now, the Poles did not make a, uh, an RP-46, but I believe this is an exact copy of the Russian pattern of trigger assembly, uh, trigger frame and buttstock. Now I have seen some pictures of one that actually has a shoulder uh, rest here that folds down over the top. I don't know if that's Russian or Chinese, uh, but this is the, the standard pattern that you typically see. And the North Koreans on this one did a few things differently. So you can see the frame of the grip is different. And that's not just the wooden panels, it's also the metal uh, shell underneath is a different shape. Uh, the buttstock is a slightly different contour. This is very similar to the North Korean Type 73, which is sort of a knockoff of the PKM. Uh, same pattern as the buttstock on those guns. Uh, it does attach exactly the same way. So you've got uh, tang screws on the bottom as well as the top, and one screw right down there. Uh, in the middle. So it attaches the same way, but the shape of the buttstock is a bit different. And you can see it has this shoulder rest on it, which folds out like so. As I said, I've seen these in pictures of guns that have this, this profile of stock, but do have one of these. So whether that was a Russian pattern or Chinese, uh, that I'm not sure. The North Koreans do also have a trap under here, very much like the RPD which the standard gun does not. So uh, this does make the North Korean ones uh, visually distinctive because, well, you can see them in a couple ways. You can see the difference in the front sight uh, location, and then you can also, in most pictures, you would be able to see the profile of the buttstock. Now the one other version that I do want to talk about briefly is uh, SMG guns, uh, modern reproduction example right here. And now that you've seen the original, there are a couple elements on this that I can show you that should make a little more sense. First off, the carry handle no longer is linked to an attachment lug on the bottom. So in theory, that's not as good for actually carrying the gun. However, what uh, SMG did instead is they added these two spring catches, and these lock into the vent holes in the barrel shroud, which are standard on all of the regular, uh, all patterns of Degtarev machine gun. So you're not, you're still not actually carrying the gun by the magazine catch, you're now actually carrying it by the barrel shroud again with these two little lugs. In addition, you'll notice that this one stays politely shut, where the others I was always having to deal with the top cover trying to pop open. And the reason for that is on the originals, the latch that was actually held in place by the, the rear magazine catch is on the top cover itself. So when you pull back the magazine catch in order to open the thing and you know remove the belt or manipulate anything inside there, uh, you actually lose the entire rear attachment to the gun. Now it's not going to really go anywhere because you've got this feed block that sits down into the receiver, but uh, that does also make it really awkward when you've got the top, co the, the top assembly out by itself because it's always trying to spring open. What SMG did was they machined that locking catch onto the bottom portion of the assembly, and then they added a second spring catch right here that allows the top cover itself to open. So on theirs, this thing is always securely held onto the receiver, front and back, and then this catch allows you to open the thing to do any manipulation that you need to do. As for the gas system, SMG has two different solutions. They have the one that they came up with at first, and then one that they came up with a little later on that, that appears to work a bit more reliably, a bit better for everybody. Uh, their initial solution was actually just to uh, basically shut off the front of the DP 
uh, flash hider. And so this turns it into basically a muzzle, a, a booster, gives a little more back pressure on, uh, on the system and actually helps helps reliably cycle the gun. And that works really well for like 90% of people, including the one that Carl and I were shooting. However, while they were tinkering around, they actually came up with a better solution. And that is a redesigned gas block that actually has a very small short stroke piston in it. Uh, and that allows them to, to use the original DP style of gas piston uh, without having to go to the lengthened uh, new RP46 gas piston. And by having a basically an M1 carbine style of short stroke piston built entirely into the gas block, they're able to eliminate all of the gas leakage. Um, the regular DP gas system has a lot of, of has a very large clearances to it. And so you have a lot of gas leakage. And on for the people uh, that were having reliability issues with this system with just the, uh, the converted uh, flash hider slash booster, the problem was that little bit of gas leakage was just enough to cause the guns not to run well. So um, I haven't had a chance to try one of them out yet, but apparently uh, the redesigned gas block as a short stroke piston tap it system uh, has eliminated that as a problem. So if you're interested in an RP46 setup on either a full auto or semi-auto Degturev, uh, these are really uh, an excellent option because they're readily available. Um, you can get them from SMG's website at smgguns.com. Uh, the website is is really pretty antiquated and looks, to be blunt, terrible. However, the products are very good. So if you're interested, shoot them an email or a phone call and uh, they'll hook you up and I don't think you'll be disappointed with it. All right, well, hopefully that uh, has given you more information than you previously had about the RP46. Um, and again, like I said at the beginning, a lot of people think that this was just a belt feed adapter, and it really was several elements more than that in order to make the whole system work as a belt fed gun. So the original sets do come up for sale occasionally, but they are really quite scarce. And uh, often you will find just the top feed, just, just the adapter uh, element for sale. And with that alone, it takes a substantial amount of modification on the gun, permanent modification to actually make it work. So. If you are looking for one, and if you're looking for one, make sure to find the whole kit, or at least as much of the kit as you can find to minimize the number of parts that you need to reproduce. And with things like the bipod, to have those uh, cool non-mechanical non but distinct elements that make an actual RP46 instead of just a converted Degturev. Uh, if you don't want to spend the time, which is substantial because of how infrequently these appear, or the money, which is also substantial because they're quite expensive kits. If you don't want to spend that on an original RP46, well, I would strongly recommend that you take a look at SMG Guns reproduction ones. Uh, this avoids a lot of the hassle of uh, the original guns by making these things able to just bolt onto a standard full auto or semi auto Degturev. So uh, we have some video over at InRange TV of Carl and I doing some shooting with uh, one of these reproductions. We've had great success with them. I really like the concept. And for people who don't have the time and money and inclination to try and deal with building an original RP46, this is a great way to get a, uh, a reproduction that really does fill the historical uh, niche of a belt-fed egg drive. Anyway, getting a little bit long-winded here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.